Good morning. And how special is it to talk to extended family and have them listen, right? <laughs> it was a great evening last night, and that sense of family was very, very strong. Just want to tell you I'm delighted to be here. And it was great to see so many of my patients all in one place, which never happens in normal life. So what I'm going to take a few minutes to address are all these issues that come after the decision has been made and, uh, and surgery happens. And then, of course, there are many questions as to what do we do. So I'm sort of focusing on the medication-related issues, okay, because uh, Gary will be talking in detail about surgically-related issues. And uh, so some of the uh, most important questions that people ask me are, should we be on the same medications after surgery as before surgery, right? That's a very common question. The next one, obviously, is when can we discontinue the medications? Uh, the common one, how do you select the timing and the order of medication elimination? And, and this is probably one of the most important and fuzzy questions. Will remaining on at least one medication guarantee lasting seizure freedom? Because that, that would really answer many other questions if we knew that exactly. And as I say, the decision making is inexact. They are framed by personal experience, impressions, not entirely scientific. But to begin to approach it as to what the variables might be, and then realizing that there are probably half a dozen variables at least that we would consider, but they would end up being weighted differently on the individual case. The factors are always the same, but some factors are more important in some cases, and that's what makes it uh, uniquely different. So some of these factors include what is the underlying substrate, meaning how clearly uh, we're able to say we got everything that is abnormal in the procedure we did. Or is it, as uh, Don Shields just talked about, are we dealing with a, a good, bad situation or better, worse situation? Because that would obviously have a significant impact on whether we dramatically improved seizure control or we pretty much cured and eliminated it. Okay, Duration and severity of seizures, it is a factor in my mind because if you believe in what you've been hearing even yesterday from Stella regarding plasticity, you know there is good plasticity, there is bad plasticity. One of our rationale for doing the surgery, as uh, Dr. Shields just mentioned, is really for development. We really want the better or the good part of the brain to be unleashed from the impact of constant electrical noise, right? Now the adverse plasticity is that the good part of the brain, if it has been exposed for a very long time to seizure impulses, it may have acquired some ability to generate seizures on its own. And this is a tricky thing to assess. So when you have done your hemispherectomy, you've eliminated one half, if it was done very early, the other good-looking part is likely to be cleaner than if the case came to us, you know, at the age of eight, and for the last seven years there have been a lot of seizures, right? So that's what we mean by duration and severity of seizures. Uh, Pre-surgical imaging and EEG findings are very encouraging, and often we have a range of findings, again, where we find that the other hemisphere has some issues, but this has to go to achieve anything out of the other. On other cases, we find one side looks essentially clean. It looks clean on the MRI. Then I always tell the parents the caveat is the MRI's ability to discern subtle abnormalities gets better with age. So sometimes you don't see things as a newborn. You begin to see at five, six months. Things you don't see at five, six months you may see after a year in the MRI. That is simply because as the brain develops better, its chemistry changes, and there is better contrast because of the better chemistry in the structural details. 
So w if we don't see any abnormality, it's not a guarantee there isn't an abnormality, but I often tell parents, so far so good. You know, and then if the EG looks fairly reasonable, and then if you repeat it just prior to surgery and it continues to be so, then the chances improve that you may be able to come off of medicine at some point. Acute post-operative seizures. This is probably one of the few factors that has been systematically studied, unlike many others where we carry impressions. That is, in the immediate post-operative period, during that week or less or more, depending on the case, that you are here right after the surgery, may in fact give us a sense of how the prognosis is to do. And post-operative seizure control in a more longitudinal way. Obviously, taking medicines off does not become an overriding concern in somebody who continues to experience seizures. <laughs> However, in some people, we have to factor all the other things. If we find that they're on two medications, but they haven't had a seizure in the last nine months, and they're beginning to ask this question. Okay? And uh, then we also have to factor what the medications are doing to the child currently. So sometimes we may have to simplify them, sometimes we may shuffle them, we may eliminate some, saying we accepted the evil of this drug that is making him kind of sitting there drooling because at one time we couldn't control the seizures. At this point, we may still need the medicine, but maybe not necessarily that primidone or mycelene, right, for, for example. So those kinds of decisions have to be made. But as I told you, the acute post-operative seizures is one that has been studied. There are a few papers on it. And uh, the other thing is I mentioned how lateralized is the abnormality. So I, I kind of gave you a range of things. You will notice some items are strictly in one half and others are tipping into the other. So things like stroke or AVM, you know, we know they're very localized problems. You have a reasonable faith that there shouldn't be anything wrong on the other side. On the other hand, Rasmussen's, you see, it just tips a little bit in, because in most people it is one, but every now and then we hear of cases where Rasmussen's has spread to the other. It's uncommon, but we have to keep that in mind. Likewise, you notice Sturge Weber syndrome kind of penetrates that diagonal line, because in the vast majority, you know, it is one-sided, but not always. There are people where you may still end up doing a hemispherectomy, but knowing that the other side is not perfect and has the potential to generate some seizures of its own. Uh, hemicortical dysplasia, some places are very clean, some are not. Some, as Don mentioned, can be even focal, where you don't need to do a hemispherectomy, but you do a low bar or even a sub-low bar. Hemimegalencephaly is a wide range. Some people are very lucky. And uh, other times, you know, we can even see up front that the other side is not. So this is definitely a factor that influences how we assess that individual's pathology within this range of abnormalities that led to the surgery and how they had done, but as I said earlier, how long they have experienced seizures. I mentioned to you that acute post-operative seizures have been studied a little bit here are just examples of a couple of papers. You'll notice they go back to 2004, 2006, and you know why as you look around the room. You, you cannot do these studies, you know, every time, uh, every year, in every place, because there's the volume of surgeries is such that you need a, a reasonable number to collect. One of these papers is a little uh, bit of a mixed bag of hemispherectomies and other types of surgeries. And that is uh, from the Cleveland Clinic, uh, that is the money and uh, co-workers with the Bingaman as the surgeon. In, in that paper, they kind of realize that the post-operative seizures in the immediate post-operative period were in fact predictive. And overall, they found that they were perhaps somewhat less with hemispherectomy compared to uh, just regular low bar but extra temporal. They were pretty good in temporal. So they had a range of findings, but in the end, when you look at them up to, in, this, in their case, up to two years, roughly 26% of their patients still had seizures. 
that was predicted from the immediate post-operative period. The other paper by uh, Susan Coe and colleagues is from uh, our group, and I just extracted a couple of tables from it. So you can see that, uh, you know, the question was asked whether the type of hemispherectomy made any difference, and you can clearly see that no seizures was 75 to 78 percent, regardless of the type of procedure for hemispherectomy. And similarly, you don't see a big difference in those who had one to five acute post-operative seizures. So the type of surgery within a group with the same surgeon does not make to seem a, a big change. But here you're looking at seizures by pathologic substrate. And here you notice, if you look under the top row, no seizures. As I mentioned to you in an earlier slide, you can see in Rasmussen or infarct ischemia, it's approaching 80%. But then it comes down to two-thirds in hemimegalencephaly. And this is exactly because of what I told you. The other hemisphere may not be entirely clean. So similarly, if you see one to five acute post-operative seizures, we saw that in Rasmussen's in about 14, 15 percent, in infarcts and ischemia in about 11. But you come all the way to hemimegalencephaly, uh, it's almost one in four. Okay? So... Uh, so based on all that, this is from the same paper. Uh, if you look at the highlighted section on seizure-free people, in the aggregate, those who had no acute post-operative seizures, the number is 77%. And that's consistent with what you hear at many meetings. People say 75 to 80% of the people. That's very true. However, if you look at those who had more than 5% acute post-operative seizures, that number goes down substantially. So the, the question then on how many AEDs, you notice in the zero APOS, if you go all the way to the bottom, typically they're on less than one medication, right? 0.8 means some people may actually not be on any medication. But you notice that number has come down even in the first six months to 1.3. By one year, it's all already down to one. So this indicates our preference, and Gary will tell you, if we follow people longitudinally, sometimes our numbers for seizure freedom are higher at one or two years than five or six years. And that's why we often leave on one medication, choose the one best tolerated. We don't really have a data that that will prove that you won't have another seizure. We want to be careful to tell you, we don't have that data, but it's something you do with faith. Okay? It's just a neurologic gestalt. But if you look at the ones with more than five, you notice after all this they're on up to four medications. So really the clinical course and what we learned before are big factors. The other fa uh, issue that comes up that pertains to medications are post-craniotomy headaches, headaches slash migraines. This is not uncommon and unfortunately poorly documented when we take the specific instance of epilepsy surgery. When I review this field, it is completely dominated. If you go even do a Google search or go to Google Scholar or PubMed, you'll find that the vast majority of places this topic is addressed are all uh, patients who had aneurysms and had an aneurysm clipping. Okay? So it's really kind of a subpopulation in which the, it is said to be very high. From our perspective, from based on clinic experience, I would say they're relatively common, but they are seldom problem number one, two, three, or four in the child's life. In other words, we talk about it episodically in the clinic. It's not a deal breaker. Some of them have a migraineous quality, but you also know if you took a purely migraine population, there's a good number in whom it was triggered after head trauma, right? So uh, what Gary does in the operating room is a bit of head trauma, right? So it's not entirely uh, surprising <laughs> that <laughs> this occurs, right? Yeah. So however, very few of them develop that type of headaches. I cannot think of more than probably less than 5% of my patients who are actually on headache prophylaxis medicine. For the most part, I can treat them with 
as they occur with simple measures. Okay, and if they are on just one anticonvulsant medication, otherwise, but continue to experience recurrent headaches with a migraineous quality, sometimes a small dose of topiramate can be helpful because it's anti-seizure and anti-migraine. On the other hand, who have seizures not terribly of a migraineous quality, but bothers them enough that it's very, very frequent, but po poorly classified, Sometimes I would use amitriptyline or nortriptyline, one of those so-called tricyclics, in fairly small doses, okay? And in terms of abortive therapy, what do you do? Pretty commonly used medicines, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, any one of those. So it, it is an issue, we recognize it, we see it, but it's really not a leading problem. Okay, so that's again the other thing we treat with medicine. As you know, everything else, various forms of therapies, that's not part of my talk. So I'm going to sort of close here in my allotted time. And uh, for those of you who have come from the Midwest, if you are not in Disneyland and go to the beach, that's what it looks like in Malibu. <laughs> and uh, if you have never been to visit us, that's our hospital, uh, which we occupied two years ago. Okay. Yep.